All right, sweet. And just tell you a little bit about my background. You know, I'm a physiologist. A lot of what I do is in the world of, you know, the realm of health optimization, longevity, human performance. I have a background in psychology and nutrition. I've been following you for quite some time now. Absolutely love your content. I love it when you guys publish those videos of, you know, what the staff eats in the office. <laughs> I think it's so cool because it goes against a lot of this the traditional approach to disease prevention, right? People think, oh, you eat too many eggs, you eat too much red meat. That's carcinogenic, IGF-1, growth factors, et cetera. And here you are eating all these nutrient-dense foods. So what I really appreciate about your work is the junction between East meets West, between all these different approaches, it sort of comes to one. And this is something I typically see in something like a you know concierge medical practice. And it's like, you're one person, you know, bringing all this, this goodness together and helping so many people optimize their lives, live longer, prevent cancer and revert some of these chronic states. So. Welcome to the show. Can't wait to pick your brain about some of these topics to dive deep on the science of prevention and health optimization. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Sweet. So why don't we begin with your why? Because you know, you're prolific in the world of, of cancer today. You've been at this for some time now. And I'm wondering what what did it take? Why do you do what you do? And how did it bring you to this junction? Well, there's lots of little things that happened in my journey, but I think the biggest thing that changed my life is when I was 16 years of age, my parents received a letter that my mother had taken a drug called DES, diethylstilbestrol, which was a drug given in the 50s to prevent miscarriage and bleeding. And I'm number three of six children, and my mother started bleeding, and they gave her this drug. They found out that that medication, DES, caused cancer in male and female offspring, infertility, hormone problems, anatomical problems, all kinds of different things in different people, depending on what time in utero it manifests differently in different people. And so that was a very pivotal thing because I started going to a cancer hospital in Houston, Texas, one of the biggest in the world. You know, I've never been at 16, you never, you know, go to the doctor. So here you are going to a teaching institution and being, you know, thoroughly investigated because you're you're kind of become an obstacle because you are an unusual case. And so anyway, that was the time also that I thought, okay, I can be a doctor. I'm really good in biology, but what can I do in biology and also talk to people because I didn't want to be in a laboratory with Bunsen burners. And so that kind of catapulted. I went you know, to college and, and got my degree actually in biology and Latin. And then went to medical school. I actually went to a school of public health at UT, University of Texas, then went to medical school, and then went to training at UCLA, Harbor General, which was a county hospital. So then I started my practice. I met a doctor, it was very interesting. I met a pathologist internist who had developed this patented treatment for smoking cessation. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting you know, how he's dealing with, you know, because back then, 35 years ago, lots of people smoke compared to now. Anyway, I was fascinated by, I go, what is this patented treatment? So I met this doctor. It was in Texas, even though this clinic was in Beverly Hills. And I said, oh my goodness, let me see this. So they explained everything and it was published in the International Journal of Addictions. And I'm like, this is like unbelievable to do this. And it was actually utilizing little medications to, you know, block the nicotinic receptors. So then he started telling me about all kinds of things that I didn't learn in medical school because he was a pathologist. So he was the internal medicine doctor and the pathologist looking at the live tissues. He opened my eyes to other things, you know, from an endocrine system point and everything. And so I grew up in Texas and my mother was really natural about like, we only ate at home. We ate liver and onions and sauerkraut and all the things that are fashionable today. And we had a farm, my grandparents had a farm. So we would go and they would, my mother would pick up a whole cattle and deep, put it in the deep breeze. So I grew up like that with raw milk and, you know, everything fresh. Cause back then things were not like they are now very automated and already processed, et cetera. So, but we never, my, my brothers and sisters, we never ate cereal. We never had any of that kind of food. I'm not saying we never had something bad because that wasn't true, but we mostly ate at home and my mother cooked all of our food. She nursed us all. And 
and we only ate baby food that she personally made. So I grew up luckily like that, or I would have, you know, probably not be as where I am today because she would, she used to read Adele Davis. I don't know if you know Adele Davis, but if you don't know her, it's somebody you should look up because she was really a movement in and of herself many years ago. And I have all of her books and I read her books because we learn from history. So we need to learn from these people that already have really talked about these kind of things. Then I never had two periods in a row in my life. Okay. I had, that was my first project was figure out that. And then, you know, I had infertility. Then I delivered twins 28 years ago. The doctor thought he was putting the medicine in the epidural space. It wasn't in the epidural space. And so I developed something called Sheehan syndrome. Sheehan syndrome is when a woman is in pregnancy and they go through shock. So I spent about five or seven years trying to figure out because I went to all these doctors, endocrinologists, famous guys, and they could not figure me out. I would like suggest, well, what about this? And what about that? I was reading all the books and telling them, well, why don't we try this? And, why? and so they kind of agreed because I was a physician. You know, if I would have been a regular patient, they probably wouldn't have listened to me, which is really bad. And so little by little, and then I heard, of, I had a patient come in from Mexico. She told me that she got a pituitary transplant. I thought like, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Who gets a pituitary transplant, right? And your pituitary, right, is your master gland that controls all of your hormonal output, right? I was like, okay, I got to look into this. So I went to her place of work and I talked to her about it. And I said, well, give me the name of the doctor and I want to talk to them. So I fortunately speak Spanish. And so I called the doctor and the doctor explained exactly what he does. And I was like, wow, this is pretty impressive, right? So I said, where did you learn? And so anyway, there, there's a school of gerontology in Querétaro, which is a couple of hours from Mexico City. And so I called them. I read all the books on what they were doing. And they've been doing this for a year. At the time that I learned about it, they'd already been doing it for 30 years. And I go, wow, this makes sense. Because, you know, all about eating, you know, how like we talk about eating organs and, and how that can replenish and fortify an organ, right? I went there to get a pituitary transplant 20 some odd years ago. And it was one of the most, one of the most miraculous days of my life. In 24 hours, I was like, oh my God, I have myself back. They use it still today. Uh, it's not obviously done here in the United States, but they've been doing it, you know, for 50, 60 years. So I've had like my own personal journey of I call detours and detours are always for you to learn and become awakened and to become enlightened. And to also you use those detours to be of help and serve and bless other pretty people. Otherwise you would never, you nothing gets your attention until you have pain, right? You, you don't go, oh, I'm going to go start researching migraines if you don't have a migraine, right? You don't realize, you, you know, the importance of your right arm or left leg until it's broken, right? And then you got like, then all of that becomes center attention, right? My, my health detours have like, dramatically changed my life and how I look at medicine, how I look at each patient. And now what I really want is I want everyone to know what I know. And I, I, I want to share to 8 billion people what I know. And I don't know everything, but what I do know, I can really impart that and share and teach and really teach, you know, individuals, even if they're not doctors, but the things I don't know, I have the worldwide experts like, okay, I can call this person. I can, you know, let me get their two cents. Let me get this. Like I was just in Mexico for the weekend and I met, I had an old girlfriend. She, I met her years ago at a conference and she's from Austria and she's an MD dentistry. So she's a medical doctor and a dentist. I hadn't seen her. She just moved to Mexico. She wanted to get away from Europe. And so she moved to Mexico about a week ago. And so we just got that, you know, talking back and forth about, different things in medicine. It was just like, she was telling me what, how they treated COVID and how she had not one person die. All they treated, all they, all they did is gave patients aspirin. And I was like, oh, that's very interesting. We need to really, you know, our healthcare system 
in the United States, we rank 43rd in the world. Okay, we can send people to the moon and have satellites and do all of this incredible things. And you and I have the opportunity to share this conversation today, but we rank 43rd in healthcare. All we talk about are the problems. No one talks about prevention, pre proactive, precise, personalized medicine. And I got an information about a course. This was two weeks ago, course for taking care of children. I said, and so they were talking about the statistics of this many kids have this and this many have this and all the different things from ADD to autism, to anxiety, to depression. And I was like, oh my gosh, how can this be? All right. This is horrific that all these children have all of these medical problems. And I know that when I was a child and in elementary school and high school, there wasn't, no one had anything. No one had obesity. No one had diabetes. No one had ADD. No one had anxiety. No one had any illnesses, cancer. I never knew anyone that had cancer. Now, obviously I was, you know, 60, this is 65 years ago or in the last 65 years, but I know that no, we talk, I talk about this with other people in my age group and no one had those diseases and people didn't, you know, people eat bologna sandwiches, right? And, and Miracle Whip and things not that healthy, but they did not have the, the disease diagnosis today. And I'm like, why isn't everyone an alarm? Like I look at it, I've been saying this for a very long time, that we're in a 911 with health. And why aren't we all? I mean, I know personally I am, but, and I know like a lot of the doctors that try to combine the conventional with the complementary integrative therapies. Okay. You know, people talk about East and West. I talk about West, East, North, South, and updated medicine. Like there's new things that are coming out all the time. In PubMed, there's 1.2 million PubMed articles written per year. So look, there's something cutting edge in those articles every single, you know, nanosecond, right? So we should be practicing updated medicine and we should also not be trying to harm our patients and hinder our patients. We should be analyzing everybody's existence when they come in. I had a patient yesterday who came in with a diagnosis of breast cancer and every, almost every patient tells me this, that they go, okay, the doctor just said, okay, we're going to do the surgery and this chemo and radiation, whatever, that's the options. She said, not one person asked me, you know, how do I sleep? What am I eating? How am I living? What's my stress like? Like no one, no doctor has done a detailed analysis of her living lifestyle environment and what she's eating. Every patient is stunned that how can a doctor not be asking me these fundamental questions that we all, like we all know now that lifestyle and how we live and how stress and all of these things are affecting us. And they just declare kind of war on the cancer or, and think that a lump or bump surgically removed can fix your body. Well, that tumor started 10 years ago. So you must change the unwell garden or terrain of that patient's system so that cancer doesn't come back. And that's what doctors should be thinking like, okay, why, where, when, and how did this patient get this diagnosis? Now I have to, that my job, I'm an authority. I'm an educated authority. I am here to teach this patient how never to get cancer again. All right. Not just the cancer they have, but any cancer. And unfortunately, we're not doing that. We're not delivering that kind of care. And then if a patient comes into you for human optimization, they just come in for a physical. Don't just do a history and a physical. Do an expansive, broad spectrum blood work. Do bioenergetic testing. To make sure they do cancer evaluations because today, one in two people have cancer. And one a major institution locally here where I am they're very, very large cancer institution. And they said that they're building a new facility close to me. They said that 
by 2030, there's a 30% increase in what we have today. So that means every physician, every practitioner should be saying, okay, let's make sure you don't have any diseases, hypertension, prediabetes, diabetes, autoimmune, cancer, heart disease, all of it. That's the first thing you should be doing. And you can figure all that out in one to two weeks, literally. Okay. And not that expensively, believe it or not. All right. It's just so sad that we are practicing reactive earthquake medicine as to let's restore health and harmony and homeostasis in that patient so that they can be the most productive person for their community. Because I tell people, health is not just important to you. You know, self-care is not selfish. Self-care is the new health care because you want to make sure that you have health because why? It's going to serve you. It's going to serve your loved ones, whether family, friends, kids. It's going to serve your where you work and what your purpose and platform is. And then more importantly, it's going to help our community. So we should be banding together and like help everyone be the best they can be. You know, one thing I always say, just to piggyback off that is sometimes it takes being selfish to be selfless. You know, you have to be the best version of yourself to be the best version of yourself, to support other people, to do what you do and only you can do, you know, and to level up your community. It starts with you. And if we can take this back to you know, why you do it, if, what you do. If I were to summarize this and bridge the gap between this and my next question. So you do what you do because you've learned so much out of necessity, right? So the East, West, North, South, updated medicine, etc. And now you want to share as much as possible with the world. Is inspiring this type of scientific self-discovery in your patients, integral part of your practice and methods. So teaching them out of necessity, you know, helping them identify the necessity and what they can do and empower them at the individual level. Absolutely. I mean, that's probably 50% of what I do in the visit. Uh, yes, I had to understand what's going on in the tapestry and landscape of what is going on. But more importantly, I have got to empower and educate them why we need to do this. Okay. And usually patients today, they're ready. I've been doing this 35 years. And now today, most people have already done some due diligence before they come to see me, which helps a lot because then they know where I'm coming from. And it all makes sense what I say, okay? I'm not saying I'm the only person who makes sense because there's people like you and there's other people that are trying to spread the same message, but in a different form, right? We're all trying to awaken humanity because we want everyone to be the best. That's what we want, okay? That's our true desire because you see the suffering every day. I mean, oh, the cases I see and I'm like, and a lot of people come to me stage four, having done everything and every clinical trial, and then they want a miracle from me. And I usually don't have a miracle in my back pocket. You know, so I get to see that kind of thing, which I don't, you know, it's not fun. It's not enjoyable. How do you be such an inspiration for a person who's in disastrous, terrible shape? I know that I spend 50% of my time with, and with any patient dealing with, I call the psychological, emotional, because it all starts with how we set our mind every day and every minute of every day. And we all, that's something that you've got to practice and get really good at because we all have thousands of thoughts every day and it all needs to be, I am so great. I am so wonderful. I'm so intelligent. I have access to the infinite intelligence of the universe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we've got to, you know, we've got to teach our patients that because that's not something a mother taught their child, right? When they were born, we could totally revolutionize everything. If we just started with that yesterday, I had a patient who came in, a husband and wife, and they're like in their forties and they have this two and a half year old. They were talking about that. That's not why they came in. They, they came in for him and they were talking about their two and a half year old and how stressful it is. And I'm like, two and a half years old, how can that be? That cannot be stressful. I mean, having a child is like one of the most beautiful experiences. And she goes, well, she's trying to manipulate us. And I said, so who is in charge? I said, you know, you and your husband 
need to be in charge. A two and a half year old cannot be in charge of your household. So I gave a whole parenting lesson before I even got into what he was there for. But so that happens like every single day. So, and you know, after my own, I'm one of six kids. I had seven kids in a combined marriage, three of my own and four uh, step. And then I have three grandkids. So, you know, I have a broad spectrum uh, approach on looking at lots of different things. So it's, it, that is probably uh, my staff always joke with me. They go, Oh my God, Dr. Kelly, you're like the best life coach <laughs> because you know, after living a while, you become like, and talking and not just my personal experience, but 35 years talking to people, you learn a lot, right? And then having gone through many, many things, I also had to know how to become the best version of myself, right? So I'm, I always tell people, I'm a patient just like you, okay? Just because I'm Dr. Keneally, I'm, not, I'm just like you. I've got to do the same work, efforts, self-care that, that, you, that I'm teaching you how to do. And, and, and I just want to highlight just how far this is from the standard. You know, I used to admire doctors because they were selfless and they had this ability to, you know, uh, help others through science, through applied science. And, and I grew up around that. I always thought that that, that was what's, what's right for me, right for my path. And as I started to do shadowing, I started to see, you know, I'd, I'd shadow some of the, you know, top doctors in this hospital and that hospital. And what I noticed that they had in common was that they were neglecting themselves and I saw it taking a toll in their ability to help other people. And a critical problem that I saw was that their patients would come back even after the most elaborate procedure, you know, for their third liver transplant, that kind of thing. And, and so there was just so much wrong. And of course, you know, a doctor, you come in, you can run down the checklist, oh, this patient needs this and that and that. And it's, it's like, like you said, it's this explosive way to help the patient at the end of the day, also neglecting your personal health and well-being. So that's what drove me to this sort of prevention end of things. But what I noticed about the two-year-old, the two-and-a-half-year-old, is you have this theme that's consistent, and it's that you're empowering other people. And the standard of medicine today, at least in the U.S., it neglects empowering others and empowering the patient, right? We kind of run through the checklist, tell you this is what you need, and this is it's as simple as that. And it's just like we have this, this dialogue that is just almost like it's not personal. It's not a personal dialogue. It's not a personal environment. So I really admire your ability to put yourself in your patient's shoes to empower them and focusing so heavily on that empowerment, on the concept of empowerment, 50%. You know, now the patient is more receptive. Now the patient is absorbing more and listening more closely. Now the patient is, is doing their homework, right? They're, they're doing their research. They're picking the right foods. They're paying attention to these little details that add up and have this compounding interest effect. So that's super, super admirable. And one thing that maybe we can discuss is, can you tell me more about this first symptom effect that we were discussing in a previous conversation? And what is that like when you're empowering a patient? Well, when I see a patient for the first time, I obviously get, you know, all their background information because you want to know if they're 37 years old what's happened your entire life, okay? What what happened? How many times did you take antibiotics? Were you exposed to something unusual? Where, you know, all these historical information, right? Because, you're, you know, there's a book, your body keeps score. Your body knows everything and you bioaccumulate and emotionally accumulate everything. So we need to know as much as everything possible. And then I have to sometimes probe them to say like, okay, you sure this, you know, something didn't happen here, there. And then of course, after people really, think because we're not taught to be mindful and conscious of our existence, right? That's just kind of, we're not taught that. And then I always ask every patient, so tell me how this diagnosis came about. So a lot of patients will say, well, I, I started feeling a tightness in my chest, or I felt back pain. And I went to the doctor and they say, I pulled a muscle, or I had a lymph gland and it went away. And six months later, it came back. And then all, so it's, it's these very nebulous little symptoms that patients, because, you know, obviously we can't wake up every day and go, okay, okay, this is, you know, the end of the world, right? But I always tell people like, you know, yes, the body has this innate ability to heal. And so if it's something that persists, I, I tell people one month is, you know, if something hasn't changed in one month, then that's 
you know, probably need to go check in with the physician. And, and, you know, a lot of doctors, like you were saying before, like we, we are a system of sick care, not health care. And it's reactive. We don't necessarily dig down deep of, you know, why the patient's really there. All right. Because you think someone comes in and they think they're fine. But then I tell people, I go, let's verify that you're totally fine. Right. And so because no disease just happens overnight, nothing, unless obviously a car accident or something emergency, but nothing just happens so quickly overnight that there's not some signs. So we need to be aware of our little things that take place. I want to know all the details of that process so I can unravel the process, okay? Because if I'm going to get that patient well, I need to know how they're thinking, how they're feeling, what's happened, you know, what they're eating, everything about them. And when people go to a physician, do, don't take no for an answer. Say, look, Dr. So-and-so, I need to get to the bottom of this. You are your best advocate. And if you need help, have someone there to be your advocate. Because I find that doctors, they minimize what the patient's saying. And because I've heard it many times, you know, the patient's having symptoms for two years. And then, oh, they just finally figured out that it was, you know, something disastrous. Okay. I had a lady doctor from Florida. She is not practicing integrative medicine at all. She's a dermatological surgeon. And so she just did her blood test and she noticed her inflammation marker was a little high, her CRP, which is a nonspecific marker for inflammation. So inflammation, I always tell people, is like the red light on your dashboard, like you on your car. You don't just keep driving the next thousand miles. You go, oh, I got to get this checked. Let me turn in the closest gas station or the car, whatever. So she went to her doctor and OB-GYN, she says, okay, you know, I want a complete exam and blah, blah, blah. So the doctor did that. And then they ordered a mammogram and they said, oh yeah, you have a little cyst on your breast. And so she talked to the radiologist. Oh, it's nothing. I wouldn't be concerned about it. And so she told him, well, I have a CRP that's elevated. Let me do. She goes, I'm going to order a whole body scan on myself. And he goes, oh, well, that's that's really overboard. Anyway, she went on with her instinct, you know, to do that. So anyway, sure enough, she has stage four breast cancer. All right. Now, that's a kind of unusual circumstance. OK, but if you're not testing, you're guessing. And blood work, I will tell you, most of the time doesn't tell you if you have cancer. Now, CRP elevation, and I talk about the, that in my book, The Cancer Revolution, I talk about the CRP. Most doctors don't even order CRP. And why don't they order it? Because there's not a drug for C-reactive protein, right? So it's purely changing your diet, taking omegas or curcumin, and that's how you get rid of inflammation. For me, though, we check it on every single person. It doesn't matter what age you are because 25-year-olds have problems of 45, 50-year-olds. So I can't assume a 25-year-old is healthy anymore because what we see here in the clinic, we need to take a deep dive and just verify that people are okay. And people, like when you go to the doctor, they do minimal blood tests, right? Because they do a chemistry panel, which checks your electrolytes and kidneys and liver. They check up CBC, which checks your white count and hemoglobin. These are all important, but they're important to make sure there's no emergency, okay? I don't want an emergency. I want to create optimal levels in your system. And then they check cholesterol. Well, cholesterol is not our enemy. It's not our villain. You need cholesterol. Every cell in your body needs cholesterol. Low cholesterol is really dangerous. They give all these people statins to have low cholesterol. Heart disease has not decreased in the last 20 years of using statins. So obviously that is not the right answer to the question of heart disease. Then they will do maybe thyroid function, depending on if the patient's complaining, but they really don't check all the things that we check, okay? If you want to do cancer screening, I will do that, a liquid biopsy. If I think there's heart disease present, which on my, my rule is, and every male over 45 gets a heart scan. A heart scan is a $100 test that tells me if you have calcifications in your arteries. If you have calcifications, it's black and white. 
Yes, you have heart disease. No, you don't. So then the doctor can do all the tests to see what's causing the predisposition to heart disease and also assess your stress, your eating and lifestyle. And then on women, I'll do it after menopause um, because they don't typically have heart disease before menopause. You can do that. And then I like bioenergetic testing. There was a famous doctor by the name of Reinhold Voll, V-O-L-L, and he discovered something called electroacupuncture, according to Voll. And he was a physicist and medical doctor. He uh, determined the acupuncture points in the organs that it related to. That was all computerized with a computer where you could see, you know, test the point, okay? And you can see energetically where it is. And so I always tell people energy precedes action. And so if I throw a baseball into a mirror, a lot of things took place before it crashed, right? So we want to detect those energy imbalances because that's the scenario that's creating the eventual crash, right? So a lot of people don't understand energy medicine or energy, but everything is energy. Your body is energy. If you look at all the cells and everything, everything is about energy, right? Well, I think a lot of people don't take it seriously because they don't hear it from someone like you, you know, when you have... You know, you having with, with your experience, you can say something like this and, and you can be taken seriously. Whereas someone that didn't go to med school starts talking about energy. They're like, all right, you know, like, OK, you know, pull out your crystals and heal my energy. So having your background is really what helps us. Yeah, your yeah, your energy. I'm energy and we have energy within us. And I always tell people when I hug you, there was an energy transfer, right? You know, and if you've ever been in love, right, you know what the energy changes, correct? So people, we really, and that's going to be the future of medicine is energy medicine, okay? Because we know all of this. I mean, this is not something new. It's just becoming definitely a more viable, you know, situation. Once people, once people learn it scientifically and applicably, they see like, oh, whoa, this is pretty amazing. So we, in medicine, it's something I personally learned 20 some odd years ago. And I will be honest, when I first learned about it, I thought, whoa, this is woo. -woo. <laughs> I'll be honest. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was like, whoa. And then I'm like, okay, I know nothing about this. I better go like research and study this. So I started and I'm like, okay, let me just, let me just start doing it in the practice. So I started doing in the practice about 24 years ago. And then it was like, oh my gosh, it's showing me exactly what I see on the patient. I was like, okay. So then once you do a hundred patients, you're like, oh goodness, this is an integral part of my workup. It's not the only part of my workup. It's just in, a, you know, a piece of the puzzle that I'm putting together. So like when you, when you check your blood, like people say, okay, I checked your blood. Everything's fine. Well, but in the meantime, the patient has headaches, they're fatigued, they have stomach problems. So obviously the blood cannot show all, everything. And the blood captures one minute of time, right? What, what's going on the rest of 23 hours and 59 minutes? So, so, you know, there's obviously more to it. And then if you do nutritional testing, what is going on with the nutrients in your cell? Do you have sufficiency of nutrients and you know what is your gut how does your gut is your gut working for you and uh, because the gut is obviously you know probably one of the center areas of concern because it's the freeway to the rest of the body and so and look what's going in our guts every day think about it from a mental emotional psychological and then food the chemicals and toxins that we're all putting in in our system we can't even conceive of what could possibly happen to people with everything that we're living in the world today, from the air pollution, water pollution, food pollution, EMF pollution, stress pollution, if you add all that up, it's a very interesting discovery process with every single person, right? Because we're all unique. We, every individual is an original. I always tell, always tell people, they always hear like, other results of different things. And I said, no, everyone's their own clinical trial. You know, studies show what happened to those 50, 100,000 people, but you're the thousand and one person or the millionth person. 
what it is going to happen to you is unique to you. It might not have happened to 99 other people, but you might be that hundredth person that you have an abnormal response. So we have to listen to the patient and say, no, that's never happened to anybody because like patients will hear that all the time. Oh, that's never happened to any other patient. That can't be true. Well, no, it, you are you and we must respect what the patient is saying to us. And so I always go, okay, let's stop everything. If the patients have a response, I go, let's stop everything. Let's recalibrate, give the body three to five days to see where we are. Try one thing at a time and three days later and the next thing. So, you know, doctors have a tendency you talked earlier about, I call it the new conveyor belt medicine. You get this drug or this surgery, there's nothing in between. That's what everybody gets. No one says, well, with you, I think I'm going to do this, you know, because this is what I see. We just have this one size fits all approach. And there was just no way you could take care of humanity like that. Yeah. And I want to speak on behalf of the young people tuning in, you know, I'm I'm in my 20s, my girlfriend's in my 20s, in her 20s. Uh, we have uh, so many friends that are our age and, and all of us have had at least one instance where we go to the doctor and we feel these symptoms and they go, no, but you're, you're, you're too young. You, you know, don't worry, you're young. You know, my girlfriend's had issues with her you know, menstrual cycle. I've had issues with a varicose seal that I had. Everyone has all these issues, but no, oh, no, you're young. That's, that's, that's normal. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. As you mentioned this, this, this theme of, you know, bioaccumulation. So things start way, way early on where they're too small to notice. Maybe you have some symptoms, but they're dismissed because it's just a normal part of being young or a normal part of being human. And then you get to the point where suddenly you have a cyst and you're like, Hey doctor, like, like what's going on? And all of a sudden it can be very problematic. So given that context, you know, what are some carcinogenic environmental toxins that young people and, and really everyone is that we're often exposed to, but can be mitigated, brought under control. You know, so for example, shower water, drinking water, EMF, sourcing food, sleeping and wearing, you know, artificial fibers like polyester, you know, et cetera. What are, what are some of these common toxins that we can maybe work to eliminate? Well, first of all, you're bioaccumulating from your mother. She's downloading all her toxins, right? So it starts in utero. As you matriculate through life, we're all exposed to hundreds or thousands of chemicals. And so we've got to examine our environment because there's no technology, not enough money, not enough resources to change the environmental pollution of 8 billion people. Because don't think about just the United States. The United States is only 330 million. Well, there's 8 billion people. So whatever's going on in all the other countries is impacting our exposure. What you have to do, again, it goes back to self-care. You've got to examine your living space. So your living space is sleep. How do you sleep? Unfortunately, now EMFs come through malls and through windows so now would you mind just describing for the for those who aren't familiar would you mind describing yeah so electromagnetic are? fields are the man-made energetic sources that come from ipads cell phones satellites cell towers computers all of even electricity there there are unfortunately so many now sources think about all the satellites they're putting up and now that we are there, they've installed 5G now in USA, basically abnormal energy waves. And because as we talked about earlier, we're energetic beings. So these are man-made synthetic energy waves that you know we're all exposed to every single day. So the most important time is when you sleep because your sleep is your restorative rejuvenation time. Okay, repair time. You need to have a bedroom that's a sleep sanctuary that there's no electrical output. So personally, I took out take, I turn off the electricity to my bedroom. So that removes all that. But then I have the extraneous exposure of the EMFs from like other people that have all their computers, all their iPads, all their cell phones, all and then it's the cell towers and et cetera, and the satellites, et cetera. So those are coming through your walls unless you use paint, let it paint that you can paint the wall. You can also put a special film. So this is a special paint that you, you know, it's just paint that you can paint the walls and it 
it protects the, from the all the uh, energetic waves coming through. So what I do, because I didn't do that, but I have had friends and patients who have done that. I just bought a canopy to go over my bed. So it's a special fine metal, a very lightweight, and that goes over my bed. I'm sensitive to EMFs. I always take care of myself by doing that. Now, they do have EMF clothing, you know, that you can wear. They have beanies. They have all kinds of things now today that have actually been around for a very long time. People do not know about electromagnetic fields because when the cell phone came out, you know, everybody thought, okay, this is the latest, greatest invention of all time. But now with the advanced versions of it, you know, your cell phone package says that it's carcinogenic, okay? And then not to mention the exposure, but there's a great book called The Invisible Rainbow. And if you haven't read it, you should read it. So it was written by a gentleman by the name of Arthur Furstenberg, and he chronicles the invention of electricity to disease. And it correlates very, very, very well. I always tell people, you know, we always want to discount what someone says or, oh, that's bullshit. The person doesn't know what they're talking about. Well, he he chronicles and tells you, you know, very well in a very large book about EMFs. Now, there, first of all, there are studies that come out every day on electromagnetic field studies. And I mean, don't just look at the studies in the U.S., look at the worldwide studies and Nobel Prize people that talk about all of this, who are experts in all of these energy waves and stuff. People need to arm themselves with education, all right? start reading this. I use his newsletter because he updates everything. He's someone so passionate about his platform. So I, and I'm personally interested because I started studying 15 years ago. My daughter was in eighth grade and we decided to, her science project was how electromagnetic fields affect living substances. And so one of the things that we did in the experiment is we took a pay, uh, one of the staff members and we took a thermography image of their brain and before cell phone, one minute of cell phone, five minutes of cell phone, an hour, and then hours. And the brain's inflamed for hours after no use. So please, I would recommend everyone to use speakerphone or one of those headsets that you do not have it to your brain. When I see people talking with it right in their ear, I just like, oh my goodness, you know, this is like the worst thing you could do. It's real. I listened to a lecture of a lady doctor recently, and she talked about like 25 year olds, why they have an increase in colorectal cancer because they carry it in their back pocket or the front pocket. You know, they show the decrease in sperm in guys wearing it in their front pocket. So just make it a policy not to wear your cell phone. I, I personally don't wear my cell phone, on, but I grew up in a time where you didn't use cell phones. So now young people, it's like an appendage. That's all they know because they're growing up with that. And so you have to learn like that's kind of like a luxury and should be used limitedly and then take the proper precautions. And the best thing you can do is ground every day. Be connected to the earth, walk barefoot on sand or dirt or be like, you know, hold on to a tree or even, you know, you can even put a copper pipe in, in the ground and hold on to it to get the energy of the earth. So nobody gets outside. So you need sunlight and you need to be grounding every day. We all should be trying to do that on a regular basis. That's the best practice you can do to counteract these negative energy fields. So this is, it's great to hear this from you because it helps justify some of my crazy habits and, and biohacks that I'll, I'll just quickly lift off for the people tuning in. Maybe, I'm sure you'll appreciate this. I'm currently wearing earth runners, you know, the grounding sandals. I sleep on a grounding mat. I have a blue shield device plugged in to my bedroom. What it does is it counters the non-native EMFs and I'm also using a rounding mat. Typically when I'm working right now, I don't have it with me. And then beyond that, you know, for phones, you can use Fender Shield. It's like a, a, a phone case that you can use. Yeah. Then for men's underwear, they have the uh, GoFont line. Those are great too. I think those are also silver. So they're like antimicrobial, if I'm not, not mistaken. I, ha I, haven't gotten, I haven't had a chance to, to get my hands on those. There's an incredible movie, the Earthing movie, that takes you through some of the science. What I know, there's a... There's some good research on the influence of EMFs on like, you know, your the activity of your acetylcholine receptors. Uh, we don't know how bad things can get. I mean, I, at least I don't think we know, but, you know, just knowing that they have an effect 
uh, you know, in the brain, like you just said, and then, you know, the acetylcholine receptors, that to me is always, you know, a little, uh, can be a little right, frustrating. Well, it's something that we're, it's, yeah, it's everywhere. And so we need to all err on the side of caution. All right. We can't find out 50 years later, oh, now it caught. No, we need to take action now and take proactive protection now. It's very, very disturbing because I just feel like we've, in the last 30 years, we've lived in a world that's been unchecked and unbalanced. And like no one's, no one cares about what is, how is this going to affect me? Okay. The food, the water. So anyway, we're talking about toxins. So, you know, now today, so they examined every jar of baby food, every type of brand, including organic, and found heavy metals. So in the air, in the water, in the food, you have to assume there's toxins. And now probably one of the biggest toxins, I would say the number one toxin for most people is plastics. So the first thing you should do is get rid of all plastics in your life as much as possible. It's impossible to get rid of 100%. But I always tell people, you're helping yourself and helping the environment by getting rid of plastics. So I personally have been using only glass for 30 years. So only only glass, only wax paper. I try not to use any plastic. Now, obviously some things are in plastic, but I try my best. But plastics are endocrine disruptors. They're not good for your body. They destroy the functionality of every organ. So we're going to have to be doing, they, they now found microplastics in the blood now of everybody so we eat a credit card a day and so now we're going to have to to counterbalance that we're going to have to be doing plasmapheresis which is filtering the blood of all your toxins because yes you can do sauna yes you can take things like zeolite or carbon 60 there's all these wonderful things to detox chlorella and cilantro for heavy metal but I think it's going to come down to literally filtering your blood, which I personally have done myself. And you can look, you know, if you look at all the patients, have lots of, you can tell when it's supposed to be, you're supposed to, you know, your serum is supposed to look like chamomile tea. And if it doesn't look like that and it's bloody and foamy, you know that there's inflammation. Unfortunately, that's kind of where we're getting to because these toxins like the nanoplastics are very difficult to come out. And then most of people here probably listening know about glyphosate, which is the weed killer. That's in all of us. You know, the one of the ladies that I follow that's an expert on this is Stephanie Sinap. I don't know if you know her, but if you don't know her, make sure you look her up. And she's, she's a scientist researcher from MIT, fabulous lady, unbelievable in her 70s. And she talks about the biochemistry of glyphosate and how it affects the gut. We have all these chemicals and toxins. That's why everybody has so many gut disorders, IBS, or I don't know gut disorders. There are all kinds of things. And then I think that's why we're susceptible to candida and parasites, because we have a weakened system because of all the chemicals and toxins that we're all ingesting. Even if you're really good, like let's say you're really good at what you sounds like you're very conscious of what you're doing. I don't think it's possible to be exactly pristine, perfect and pure in your system. So that's why you have to do these counterbalancing situations. I tell people it's not you that's so bad. It's the world we're living in is not good. Nothing's going to change it. The plastic industry, they've already been sued. All these industries have been sued and nothing changes. Okay. That's what's so sad about what's going on in our world. I know there was a lawsuit suing against installation of 5G. It's a ten, One of my patients was the one of the attorneys that wrote a 10,000 page lawsuit that we should not be installing 5G. But again, you know, things just go on and on and on. And, and it's, it's, it's a tragedy that we do not care about the survival and not only the survival, but the actual excellent level of how humans should live. So it's people like you, it's people like me, it's people like all these other people. And I love the fact that young people are really wanting to change things. I love that because they have a whole different lens than me. And so synergistically, we can try to change as many people as possible. And I just think like, I know we can 
get back to excellence and have a heroic standard of the way we live so that people, you know, if one person is sick, look how many people it affects. Look how many systems it affects. So if we could just totally really attempt to transform as many people as possible. Now, I know you don't always have a willing patient, okay? Now, personally, if I don't have a willing patient, we can't be in partnership because I'm only as good as the patient's going to be, right? So I always tell people, you have to have focus on what you're doing, clarity of what you're doing, and execution of the plan. And so I can only help someone who's going to help themselves. It only works that way. And, you know, I want to share for the people tuning in who know me and know that I'm always trying to find every little tiny way to optimize. Like I really, I really do it all. And I think this should be the standard, you know, and and I think you and I are living examples of what that standard should look like. But even then I recently did some very thorough blood tests. I'm getting my GI map, you know, I'm working with a functional medicine specialist and such and and, and all that. I discovered things that are the result of my environment. There are things that are beyond my control and certain symptoms for things that are just beyond my control. I'll give you an example. You know, I thought that I had everything figured out in my apartment. I have the blue yeah. shield. I have the grounding mats. I have the rock. I have everything you can imagine. The one thing, and I'm like, as soon as I had this like epiphany, I just kind of almost like slapped myself. I didn't have a shower filter. I didn't have a shower filter. And where I live, I'm in Miami Beach. I'm in South Beach. If you go on the, I believe it's the yes. EWG website, it's like this county has like the worst water anywhere. It's like just terrible. You're showering and you have all these heavy metals, you have all these toxins, you have pharmaceutical drugs and ingredients. It's it's unbelievable. And not only are you showering in it, so your body's absorbing it, but there's also the steam. So you're breathing it (laughs) and that's how you start your day and how you, and what you do before you go to bed, you know? So you brush your teeth with it and then you wash your clothes in it. And it's like, that's like the one thing that I haven't mastered just yet. And we're moving soon. And when we move, we'll have the chance to uh, completely redo the water systems, but maybe if you can touch upon, is there a specific kind of filter that you recommend for the shower or is there some kind of water filtration device for, for drinking water? You know, I have the Aqua True, so it does reverse osmosis. Uh, it has like a three or four stage filter. Then I have to add minerals back in. It's literally just H2O, but are there any particular devices, brands that you like as far as- Right, water well, goes? I personally have a whole house filtration system And I always have. So, because obviously I've learned this a long time ago, but I have a whole house system. The one I have now, I have a Synergy Science, a whole house system. And then on my faucets, I have the Synergy Science for like cooking and water, daily water and everything, because I can do hydrogen water, alkaline water and things like that. You You can select what you want in that moment. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow, so, and I have nice. that at the office too. I have everything here at the office because I want my staff. Most of my staff is really interested in being healthy. I have special water here for them. And now I don't have to have a shower filter. There is special shower filter. I can't tell you the name, but I, I'll email you back so you can tell your listeners because that's a whole science in and of itself. And I'm always learning new things. So, I'm always updating what I possibly know. So I think that's an important thing. But I always tell people that is something you have to invest in. You have to invest if if you don't have a house, like let's say you rent or something. So you have to just get a good water system. So I tell people like a Berkey water. It's not that expensive. Yeah. yeah, So that's a good system to get. Okay. And then get a shower filter. That would be the best thing to do for people, you know, just listening, something simple to do. And then always, always, always don't use plastic water bottles at all. And number two, because the, so what they did is they took a bottle of water and they put the water in, tested it. It was fine. And then as it sat, it made thousands of bad chemicals. <laughs> so you can't drink out of plastic water bottles. You just can't. You got to make a cardinal rule. I know there's going to be extenuating circumstances you're in an airport or something like that, but you, on a daily basis, I, you know, you should drink out of glass or stainless steel. I like glass personally because stainless steel, I feel like it changes the water, even though a lot of people use stainless steel. So, but water is, you know, water, you're, you're, when you were born, you were 95% water. Now you're 70% water. You need to have water 
for the proper dilution of pollution in your body. People need to be very, you know, invest in that. Because first of all, you're investing in plastic water bottles. So you might as well put that same investment into good water, a good water filter and a Berkey system or something like that. That's what I personally will use. And always learning. I always say I'm always having to, to research because better things come out all the time. So a couple rapid fire questions for you. I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on seed oils? What are your thoughts on seed oils? Are they truly carcinogenic? Is there a real way to the well, paranoia? Well, I think uh, I'm actually doing research on that right now because I've read so many reports on that, like fish oils are bad. I read a whole article, which I, I'll send to you just because for your own education. So I'm like, oh my gosh, fish oils are not good. Okay, then seed oils aren't good. They're increasing cancer. So I think you should mention that to your listeners only in the sense for education. And then I will send you everything I find because I have someone I know who will know more than me. And so I want to get that information, but that's what I know for the, for the, probably the past year, lots of people are talking about that. So I'm going to gather all the data. So I always tell people we need to be aware of now so we can change our existence now. I think there's now enough out there saying that it is contributing to disease and probably one of the worst is cancer. So I think we need to be, go down deep and, and educate your listeners about the possibility of the dangers of that. And last question for you here. What about sunscreen? Are you a fan of sunscreen? Do you use sunscreen daily? Yeah, I personally do not use sunscreen. Okay. The only extenuating time that I will use sunscreen is if I'm going to go out for more than an hour. But if it's just an hour, I use coconut oil. I have this new other, it's a special kind of tanning peptide that I've used and I can get you the name that's really good and natural. But we only use non-toxic sunscreens, okay? So most sunscreens and all the latest research came out, and I just wrote an article, and I'll send it to you in Natur about this, about skin cancers, et cetera, and about sunscreens and all that kind of good stuff. I'll send that to you that just came out. We only use zinc oxide physical barrier sunscreens. And coconut oil is a great sunscreen, okay? I never, everybody coats on sunscreen. Well, I tell people, if that's working, why do is the number one cancer skin cancer? Okay. And so basal cell and squamous cell are due to excess exposure to sun. But if it was working, why we've had the most accelerated growth of use of sunscreens. So sunscreens are toxic to you and the environment. So very, very cautious and really look, go to EWG and look for, you know, non-toxic. I can also make some suggestions of what we give our patients here. Dr. Keneally, thank you so, so much for your time, for your passion, for sharing your story with us and all this amazing knowledge that you've compiled. It's such an honor to have you. And I would I look forward to maybe having you back on the show to dig deeper on some of these topics. I have so many questions here that we didn't get the chance to go through, but for good reason. So thank you for taking us through it. All right. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate all your efforts and spreading all this to awaken as many people as possible. My pleasure.